Hi, welcome to Mission Control Houston, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We're inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room, where the Orbit 2 team is monitoring the systems and the uh, cruise activities aboard the International Space Station. We're here today to talk with uh, sixth to eighth grade students that are out at Huntsville, Alabama at uh, Space Camp. And here with us today is a special guest. She knows a little about Space Camp. Liz Warren, who is also the Space Station uh, Science Communication Coordinator. Welcome, Liz, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. I'm what very excited to speak with you. Thank you. And what is also very, very, very special about Liz being here is, well, you've been here at NASA for eight years now, and um, she is a Space Camp graduate. She went to level one and level two, and um, is also was recently inducted into the Space Camp Hall of Fame just this year. Yes, I was. Congratulations. It was, it was a lot of fun. It's a huge honor. So many people have gone to space camp, just like uh, the students we're speaking with today. I believe while I was there in June, uh, the 600,000th graduate uh, walked through the doors of space camp. So that's exciting. So again, we have a special treat for you guys. So we're ready to go with your questions. Hi, I'm Maggie Swanian, and I'm from Duluth, Georgia. Um, my question is, what are the, what are all the, um, kind of like defects almost of being in space too long? What happens to your body? What happens if you're there too long or for a long period of time? Well, that's a great question and it's actually very appropriate. I'm a physiologist. So that's like the thing I'm most interested in, what happens to the human body when you go to space for a really long time. And um, while it looks like a lot of fun to live in space and float around, it looks like a, like a great time, it's not really that good for your body. Um, gravity is this force that we live with on Earth all the time, and it helps us maintain strong bones and muscles and a strong cardiovascular system. In microgravity, while well, those systems tend to uh, decondition or get weaker, so astronauts can lose uh, bone mass, bone strength, uh, muscle strength and mass, and also their hearts get a little bit weaker among some other changes. Fortunately, we have studied these changes and we know how to prevent them or, or prevent some of the changes that occur. So astronauts have to exercise about two hours every day and uh, we make sure that they eat very nutritious meals. Uh, so just like living here on Earth, it's important to exercise and eat well and that helps our astronauts, helps you as well. Okay, question. Do we have another one? My name is Emma Hearn and I'm from Snowville, Georgia. And my question is, what kind, like when, when did you decide you wanted to be an astronaut or work at NASA? I think I was pretty young when I decided that, that being an astronaut would be pretty cool and definitely working at NASA. I might have been even younger than you. And um, I just set my goals and asked a lot of questions, asked my parents, how do I do this? I talked to teachers and really anyone can, can work at NASA. Any, there's a variety of interests, um, engineering and science and math, of course, help you uh, open up many doors to career fields. But NASA has people that are uh, artists and lawyers as well. Um, but I knew pretty young that that I wanted to contribute to space exploration. And um, I think it was in particular, there was one very inspiring space shuttle mission to me. It was STS-40. It was in the year 1991. I was still in high school. And this mission was dedicated to studying space life sciences. And I didn't know very much about space life sciences, but I knew that I liked space and I knew that I liked biology. And this particular space shuttle mission combined both of my interests and uh, with that mission, I decided I'm going to go be a physiologist at NASA. It took a couple of years, but here I am. And we're very glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Next question. Hi, my name is Cameron, and um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And I was wondering, have you ever sent any other monkeys to space other than Mrs. Baker and Abel? 
Well, Mrs. Baker and Abel were very special monkeys, but in fact, a lot of different animals, including other monkeys, have flown in space. In fact, our early space program, since we weren't really sure what would happen to the human body living in space, we, we uh, had animals go first and kind of test the waters, so to speak. Um, but in fact, we've uh, even on the International Space Station, we have a brand new aquarium. It's called the Aquatic Habitat. And uh, pretty soon, we're going to have some fish on board so we can learn about uh, multi-generational studies. In other words, send up some fish that are, that are going to, uh, to um, have babies. We'll study their babies and then their babies so we can learn uh, developmentally what happens in microgravity. But yeah, lots of animals have been to space. Do we have another one? Uh, hi, I'm Margaret Ann, and I'm from Duluth, Georgia. And my question is, who controls the shuttle or the rocket? Is it you or the astronauts? Well, I think a lot of the controlling of vehicles actually happens from the ground. Um, but I, Amiko, do you want to chime in? You know, you work here in the International <laughs> Space Station control room. This this entire room is full of a team, and and not only this team, there are many other folks that are not inside this room that uh, manage and work the systems that are the International Space Station, which is now flying um, <clears throat> 230 mile, I mean, 30, 30 miles above the Earth and, you know, orbiting the Earth, what, how many times a day? Nine, like 19? 16 times a day, every 90 uh, minutes. Or, yeah. Um, of course, the astronauts uh, are on board, you know, most of the most of the rockets to make sure that uh, all the systems are operating nominally and, and uh, of course, they have to throw switches and certainly during landing they're they're uh, having to make key inputs as well um, does that answer your question yeah <clears throat> it's a team there's no uh, yeah. no one person that manages all of that obviously and that's why teamwork is so very important to us here um, and it's also something that you can probably use yourself as um, you continue to work on your 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 uh, education career and then later in life in your uh, career, you'll see that teamwork is uh, very valuable in all aspects of your life. Good question. Do we have another one? Um, I'm Kira Hoskin from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, about how many people has America attempted to spend, send up to space? I think total there's been close to 500 people total who have been to space. And I actually don't know the distribution of Americans versus Russians versus other countries. Um, but that's actually a pretty small number when you consider all of the human beings that have existed on, on our planet. We've been sending people to space for 50 years now, which which sounds like a long time probably to to, uh, to you, but but that's, that's just only been a very short time. Um, so, I think you know in the future uh, our numbers are going to keep growing as as commercial space flight really comes on board. In fact, you know there's even been um, space flight participants or, or tourists is, is a less commonly used term, but there are companies right now who are who are working towards sending uh, people who just buy a ticket to space, uh, and uh, that's that's kind of a neat thing, opening up uh, this this once very very uh, restricted area to to more people. So I think. I think more people are going to go to space uh, very soon. Very good. <clears throat> and as Liz said, I mean, I don't really know that distribution as well. I don't have my cheat sheet with me. Um, however, but I have talked with several of these folks who have flown to the International Space Station, and I will tell you that they all recognize that it is a privilege and an honor to fly aboard the International Space Station. But it is something that is obtainable. And so if it's something that you aspire to do, uh, you know, I would encourage you to continue with your studies. That is always first and foremost, um, even just to come to work here um, at NASA is very, very important. So continue with that, and uh, you'll you'll see, see your dreams. Absolutely. You know, one of one of the uh, key aspects of space camp, and, and one of the things that we learn at space camp is teamwork, uh, the importance of being a good follower as well as a good leader. So the, those skills, I, I recall learning um, pretty much for the first time at space camp and space academy. Um, and, and believe me, those skills, those little little bits that you take away from space camp, uh, they're with you for, for the rest of your life. I still draw upon experiences that I learned uh, at space camp. Absolutely. Good question. Do we have another one? Hi, I'm Matt Stone from Lawrenceville, Georgia. And my question is, what is the longest period of time that an astronaut has been in space? 
Matt, that's a good question. The longest time at once, like in one consecutive uh, stay in space uh, was actually uh, done by a Russian. His name is Valery Polyakov, 438 days, so well over a year this gentleman stayed in space. Um, we have other, we have many other astronauts and cosmonauts that when you add up their, the number of stays that they've been in space have, have just been tremendous. I think uh, uh, Sergei Krikalov has well over a, year, over a couple of years, correct? Sure. Um, there's there's <coughs> been also, a number. Also, even today is a special day for the commander of the space station, Gennady Padaka. Today Gosh. actually marks his 700th cumulative time days. in space. So, yeah. yeah. So Several people who have, have uh, chalked up some time. Yeah. Good question. Do we have another one? Yeah, um, my name is Sarah, and my question is that um, if you could predict when humans could start going to um, Mars. You know, uh, we are learning every day on the International Space Station, how to live and work in space efficiently and safely. Uh, it's a very hard thing to do. Just keeping a vehicle in, a, in an operational state uh, is, is very hard to do. Just yesterday, we completed a very complex and very important spacewalk because we had an electrical problem on the space station. Um, so every day we're learning how to, go, how to live and work safely in space. We're gonna go to Mars. It's just a, a matter of time and, and national priority. I think if we had to go soon, we we could we could go, but we're, there's still a lot we need to learn. For example, um, just human beings. You know, being in space for that long is really hard. There are some challenges with radiation, um, and so there's a lot we need to learn. But um, I, I, I I'm sure we're going to get there uh, eventually. Okay, question. Do we have another one? Hi, my name is Brandon, and I live in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And my question is, how would astronauts, like, move around and do regular everyday things with less, much less gravity Well, than living normal? On, living on the International Space Station, uh, we say microgravity. Um, and uh, you can see video. I hope you, you're able to watch uh, NASA TV or some of the excellent footage we have on, on the NASA.gov website and YouTube sites. Um, it looks like a blast. It they looks go, like fun. They go they like float. this. <laughs> it's, it's very slow motion. <laughs> yeah. Um, all you need to, it's very effortless, though. If you want to move all the way across a room, all you need to do is push gently on, on the wall that you're near, and you'll, you'll float to the other side of the room. So. Uh, um, it looks like a lot of fun, but it, it it's also uh, <coughs> looks pretty easy. You can use your hands, you can use your feet, and um, you see them lifting very large, heavy things that traditionally we would not be able to lift here on Earth. But also, mm -hmm. I know that at times it can complicate things. And as uh, Liz had mentioned earlier about even just the uh, you know, if you imagine the gravity, especially on our bodies, you know, just the simple movements that we make, standing, sitting and walking, even though you don't have a, you may not have a, uh, a routine workout session here on Earth, um, that gives you some exercise where in space you don't get that. So um, yeah. it, I think it benefits and it also complicates things at times. Absolutely. Good question, do we have any more? My name's Ava and my question is, how does the space station orbit? Hi, Ava. Well, once you've reached a velocity that is fast enough and you're high enough uh, in the atmosphere or just outside the atmosphere, it, it stays in orbit. Now, once in a while, we have to reboost the space station. Um, once, once it's in orbit, it just goes around and around the Earth. It's constantly falling, though, essentially. And when we, when we talk about microgravity, um, we can, you can also say free fall. So the space station is always falling toward the Earth, but the great thing is the Earth is also moving away from it. So that's this neat balance between gravity pulling it down and, and the force of the space station and the speed of the space station carrying it away. It's, it's a nice balance, which, which creates that microgravity environment. Um, but the way it stays in space is, is every once in a while we have to give it a little bit of a boost because there's just a little bit of friction out there, just a few air molecules. And every, one, every time the space station hits one of those little air molecules, it slows down ever so slightly. Um, so every once in a while we have to give the space station a little extra boost and uh, it, it'll stay up there indefinitely until we're ready to take it down. Very good question. Very smart kids, I can tell. Do we have another one? Hi, my name is Reagan. Uh, I'm from Huntsville. What are the qualifications of an astronaut? 
Hey, Reagan. Well, the qualifications for astronauts are that they have to uh, have an advanced uh, education. So you've got to finish college, get a Bachelor of Science degree um, in science, math, technology, engineering, um, and also uh, usually a work experience. The more breadth you have seems to be uh, really valuable. Um, our astronauts have a, have a wide variety of skill sets and uh, experience. There are people who are marine biologists, there are geologists, there are engineers, there are, um, boy, there are, there are a whole variety. There's medical doctors. Uh, so it almost seems like any career that you choose, um, and if you want to be an astronaut, be really good at, at what you do uh, and enjoy what you're doing. Choose a field that, that is something you enjoy, and, and you'll probably excel if you're doing something that you really enjoy. and uh, and get a lot of different skills and, and pilots. Uh, there are people in the military who become astronauts because of their experience flying. So that there's a there's a great uh, great need for people with with, uh, with really high skill sets and abilities. Absolutely. Do we have any more? Hi, I'm Emily. I'm from Georgia. Um, besides exercise, what do astronauts do? Boy. Astronauts are very, very busy. When I said they exercise two hours a day, that's crammed in the middle of a very busy day. Uh, an average day in space, usually wake uh, wake up around six in the morning. Now, when I say six in the morning, that's uh, uh, on Greenwich Mean Time. So for Houston and for Huntsville, that's about two in the morning, right? Or one in the morning, it's depending on if it's, yeah, if it's central daylight or if it's uh, daylight savings time or not. Um, wake up at six, have a little bit of time uh, for hygiene, eating breakfast, getting ready for the day, getting dressed, and then right into a conference where you speak with ground controllers here in the space station uh, control room. Uh, you kind of talk about what's going to go, go on for the day, and then you get right into doing science experiments, maintenance of the space station. Uh, it takes a lot of work just to keep the space station going. Um, variety of space station experiments. You may be working with flame and combustion one minute, and then the next minute taking an ultrasound or the next hour taking an ultrasound uh, images of your heart and then you may uh, go tend to the aquatic habitat where you may have some fish um, and then have a quick lunch usually keep working throughout the day uh, maybe have another conference with a doctor or the flight director just to, to keep tabs on how things are going the day usually ends with another conference where uh, you talk about what happened during the day with the ground controllers talk maybe about what's going to happen the next day what worked what didn't work um, and in the middle there, I said, you know, you have your two hours of exercise, and then uh, and then you have a little bit of free time, and then and then bed. And that's a very very busy day. Uh, the astronauts uh, have a tremendous workload, and and almost every minute is accounted for. Very busy day, and it's every day. And every day, they get a little time to talk to their families on the weekends, and they can make a phone call here and there. Yep. Um, but but otherwise, they're extremely busy. There's six people on the International Space Station, and they're working very hard. So you can imagine how much work is getting done. Very good question. And I think we have time for another one. Do we have another one? My name is Abigail, and I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. And I was wondering. Um, have there ever been any problems in, with this rocket ship or anything that happened that wasn't supposed to happen? Well, absolutely. Space. space space travel, Abigail, is 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 difficult. We've been doing it for 50 years. We're still learning. Um, there have ab absolutely been um, some challenges to overcome. We've had we've had some accidents along the way. We've lost some people, and th that's very hard. It's something that we accept in the space business, though. Um, we go into this knowing that we're pushing the very boundaries of human ability. And uh, when you're exploring and you're pushing boundaries, um, there's going to be some losses, and we've had some very sad losses. Um, but it also gives NASA an opportunity and, and, our interna and our international partners to really shine too because when you overcome a challenge it really feels good um, like I mentioned earlier just yesterday there was a very very difficult EVA that's a spacewalk that was performed that fixed a really serious problem with power um, that it was, it was basically cut the space station's power uh, by about half, essentially. Um, so every day we're, we're having challenges almost every day. And, and when we overcome those challenges, it feels really good. And it helps us to learn so that we can do better in the future. And maybe one day get to Mars. I believe it. We will. Next question. What was the first mission they ever worked on? 
me personally, um, I was doing research as a college student. The first mission I helped with was STS-84. And uh, this uh, experiment actually um, went to the Mir space station. It launched on the space shuttle, went to the Mir space station, and stayed there with astronaut Mike Fole. And it was a little little uh, experiment um, that studied circadian rhythms or, or sleep and how well astronauts may um, may learn uh, how to how to sleep better and how light affects how well they sleep. And actually the experiment was on little beetles. We launched little beetles and little miniature um, holding can canisters. And uh, that was the first the first mission that I worked on and I've been working ever since on a, on a whole bunch of missions. It's, it's, it's been a tremendous honor and I love doing it every day. And if it's something you wanna do, um, just keep working at it. it it's, sometimes there's, there's obstacles to overcome in school or in your personal life. Um, I was very, very happy and lucky that I knew what I wanted to do, so I just set my goal and I worked toward it steadily. Do you have another one? <coughs> my name is Jemin and I'm from Ohio. And how did the people know where to land Curiosity on Mars? Wow, I, I don't even know the answer to that question, but I can guess. And I think they chose a place on Mars that was really interesting to them uh, geologically, but I am definitely not the right person to ask. There's so many things to learn about NASA, and we can't possibly all know all the answers. And I'm certainly you know? not the person to ask either. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. But you can go to www.nasa.gov. There's a ton of information there. Um, obviously, um, there was a ton of information about Mars Curiosity. There were several people who tweet. Um, on Twitter, so if any of you guys are on Twitter, um, go there. I, I would say follow the flight director, Mohawk guy, uh, Bobak Podolsky. He's um, known as Tweets Out Loud on Twitter, and uh, you can get a lot of information about what exactly is going on with that Mars rover um, there on Mars and in the that landed in the Gale Crater. We have any more? <coughs> Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm from Stone Mountain, Georgia, and I was wondering how it felt when you had a successful landing from either a human or an animal, and like they came back and they went there with no problems. Well, that, that uh, mission that I mentioned earlier, STS-84, being that it was the first mission that, uh, that I worked on personally, um, it was tremendous. I had watched a lot of space shuttle missions launched before that, and, as, and, and just watching those missions happen, very exciting and, and thrilling. But when you have a part, when you're playing a part in a, or a small role, um, it really gives you tremendous satisfaction. Everyone here at NASA, um, pretty much everyone has a very small role for the most part. And when you add up all those people working together, you can do tremendous things. And you know the astronauts, they're just the most visible pieces of, of, a, of a mission, um, but there's there's thousands of people working every day to make sure that, that we're successful. And all those thousands of people, um, I get tremendous uh, self-satisfaction knowing yeah. that I'm helping just the littlest bit, and that, that makes me feel really good. It, it's a, it just makes you feel just good inside. And I think that's a, an overall, the consensus here, I, I honestly, um, at landing, you know, I've seen many, many missions land, and I can tell you every time we land and we have a successful mission, I get goosebumps, I get excited, it doesn't change. Um, I never become desensitized where I think, yeah, yeah, I've seen it once, I've seen it all. Um, every mission is different, and every mission is special, and everyone involved in that is very special and unique and important to us, as well as the mission as well. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's very important to us, and I think, of course, we feel elated when we know that we nailed it. Next question. I'm Caitlin, and I'm from Georgia. And I was wondering about how many different types of animals have you sent up to space? Well, personally, let's talk generically. Um, boy, there's been fish, there's been monkeys, there's been insects, um, there's been mice and rats. Uh, I would say at least 10, probably, different types of animals have been in space. And, and we, can, we can study them and learn from them uh, as well as from our astronauts. Um, so I think... Yeah, quite a, quite a few critters have gone up into space, so yeah. along with our people critters. 
I think uh, that's about all the time that we have. That was the last question. We really appreciate you guys coming out and joining us again. We are inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control Houston. Thank you. Bye, guys.